the National Association of Scholars series of webinars, webinars on great American literature, usually novels, but we've had a few short stories and the like uh, as well. Now, I am delighted to introduce for our discussion of To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, three distinguished uh, professors who are whose works should be appearing in the chat button below in a little bit. So I won't say them all, but they all they will all appear and you should all go to Amazon and buy as many of them as you can. Uh, they include Professor Alan Mendenhall, who is Associate Dean and Grady Rosier Professor in the Sorrell College of Business at Troy University. Um, and his books include uh, Literature and Liberty, Essays in Libertarian Literary Criticism and Of Bees and Boys, Lines from a Southern Lawyer. Uh, the Southern Lawyer bit seems very appropriate um, <laughs> for the discussion. Uh, next, Professor Chris Metris, who is a university professor and associate provost at Samford University. Um, very uh, long list of publications, but including, for example, The Lynching of Emmett Till. Um, and then thirdly, but not lastly, Dr. Don Noble, who is professor of English Emeritus at the University of Alabama, where he taught American literature for over 30 years. Um, yo, editors of volumes on Harper, Lee, Hein, Hemingway, Steinbeck, and Fitzgerald, as well as collections of Alabama fiction, including Alabama Noir. Um, I'm David Randall, Director of Research at the National Association of Scholars. So just to say quickly, each of the uh, professors will speak for 12 to 14 minutes or so. There will then be a discussion. This will be um, prompted by you, the audience, who will put in your questions into the chat or Q&A buttons below, um, uh, which you then will have me uh, transmitting them on to the professors or the professors can just answer directly or they can just talk to one another. Um, when I do the questions, I don't do them in chronological order. I just do them in whatever order seems like it would be fun for a conversation. And I feel happy about tossing my own questions from time to time. Don't worry about not getting a question answered. Send email to me. Randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L. I will forward your questions afterwards to our participants so they can have the option of responding to you. And you know, that means that any question you have won't be left an orphan. It will get answered now or later. If you have to suddenly go in the middle of our fine webinar, it will appear within 24 hours on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel. It will be there for perpetuity. Um, so if you want to send, send a link to friends so they can see this later, if you want to go off and have a bit afternoon snack and come back later, you'll get a chance to see the end of this no matter what. Uh, having said all that, um, Professor Mendenhall, may I ask you to go first? I'd be happy. Thank you, David. And thank you for the introduction. And thanks to my uh, co-panelists for, for joining me on this great discussion. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird is a profoundly personal novel to me because of my grandfather, Jay Farish, who grew up in Monroeville. He was actually born in Atmore, Alabama uh, during the Great Depression and was uh, delivered by a doctor for free because his parents didn't have any money to pay for uh, the birth. And uh, he was uh, he was roughly the same age as Harper Lee. I think uh, he, he always referred to her as Nell. And she was four years older than he was. So if you ever asked him how old, um, how much older Harper Lee was, he would think he'd say, well, I was in the eighth grade when she was in the 12th grade. And then he would do the math from there. But uh, he always would tell um, interesting stories about growing up with Nell and uh, with Truman Capote. Uh, for example, she would play basketball on the grass basketball court in the backyard. Um, he would uh, see Truman Capote go into um, uh, I, I forget what he called it, but I, I imagine it as a, as a little diner, but uh, he would scribble on pieces of paper and, and write and the papers would pile up and my grandfather and the other boys would tease him and make fun of him and uh, say, what are you doing in there? And he'd say, I'm, I'm writing a book. And the notion that anyone from Monroeville, Alabama could write a whole book was preposterous to them and they would laugh and make fun of him. Little did they know uh, what Truman Capote would, would become. Um, 
my grandfather, when I was, uh, when I, I lived in Japan after I graduated from college and I got back and I arranged to have uh, supper with him and we talked about sort of his childhood and he drew a map of Monroeville and, and, and from when he was a kid and listed the homes where different people lived. And then he drew a list of characters and he uh, purported that uh, these, these figures were the, the people on whom Lee based the different characters in the novel. So of course, you know, uh, uh, Nell Harper Lee would have been uh, Scout Finch and Edwin Lee, her brother would have been Jim. Um, Addison would have been her father, Amasa Coleman Lee, A.C. Lee. Uh, Boo Radley would have been this figure named Son Bulware and, and goes on and on and on. And he listed all these people. Now, I don't know uh, whether those attributions are accurate or not, but it's certainly <laughs> fascinating and uh, stuck with me uh, as a uh, as an adult. Are you getting some feedback from me? I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Uh, yeah, I hear it. I'm, I'm not sure what it's from. Uh, hang on one second. You want to you want to dare speaking again and see what happens? Oh, sure. Do you hear no feedback now? So it looks as though we've fixed the problem. Um, but this discussion today is about uh, Harper Lee and and uh, To Kill a Mockingbird and whether the novel it ranks among the great American novels. So is it up there with Moby Dick? Is it up there with Huck Finn? Is it up there with the Great Gatsby? Um, in a certain way, works of Southern literature defy that uh, great American novel category with its unifying and nationalist overtones that suggest uh, there's a work that represents the essence of America. And that's because the South has always been a distinctive region um, that resisted consolidation into the idea of America. But uh, To Kill a Mockingbird has been embraced and adored by readers from all regions of the country. It's popular on Broadway now. It's a bestseller. It continues to be assigned in high school curricula all over the country. Uh, it won a Pulitzer Prize. And uh, it is beloved by many people, including the, uh, uh, the film version as well. Lawyers and those in the legal profession tend to adore the portrayal of Atticus Finch. And so uh, in that respect, it does seem to have achieved special status in uh, American history. Um, what makes the novel significant? Well, uh, novels that tend to sort of transcend uh, time and place are the uh, appeal across generations have elements to which all uh, readers can relate. So uh, the novel is a building Roman novel. It's a coming of age novel. It's a story of the maturation from childhood to adulthood. It takes place from roughly the time Scout's five to when she's eight. Um, you know, novels like this uh, throughout history from Candide to Treasure Island uh, tend to continue being read. Um, there's something about uh, a, a childhood that's relatable to every reader. Um, the narrator uh, alternates between a child's present and adult's retrospective point of view, um, but the story's told in sophisticated uh, language and vocabulary. Um, but Leah articulates a contrast between the security and innocence of childhood versus the violence and irrational prejudice of adulthood in uh, Maycomb County. And uh, the scene that to me best captures the power of childhood is when the character Walter Cunningham, the father, is part of the lynch mob and Scout calls out to him, singling him out of the throng and says uh, to tell, you know, tell your son, you know, that I, that I said hey to him. And she doesn't understand the gravity of, uh, of her innocent statement and Walter's shamed and the crowd disperses. And that's such a beautiful scene in literature. It's one of those that when I watch the film version, I can't help but get choked up. Um, that sort of portrayal of the power of innocence and childhood is something that you might find, you know, in like a, a, a in like the New Testament or Luke or Matthew when Jesus is talking about, you know, you, to, you can't get into the kingdom of God, of God unless you're, you know, unless you're like a little child or let the little children come to me. Those, those types of 
uh, images of childhood. It's not not necessarily like the words worthy in child, but it's something like that. There, there is uh, something uh, special about childhood. But the uh, maturation of Scout and Jim involves the realization that the town of Maycomb is grotesque and violent and dangerous, despite the free range and fun that they enjoy as children. This is a place where there is that uh, lynch mob that I mentioned. There's a rabid dog. Atticus's first two clients are hanged. Um, you know, the Scout and Jim's mother uh, dies. Tom Robinson's trial is obvious, uh, the most obvious example of, of injustice, um, but there's fighting at school. Bob Buell, the character um, who uh, accuses Tom Robinson, uh, confronts Atticus physically and attacks Scout and Jim. Um, he harasses the black communities. Miss Maudie's house catches on fire. Boo is confined to his home. There are a lot of dark and disturbing things happening in this uh, sleepy town. Um, on the other hand, the children learn that humans possess uh, both good and bad, uh, and that badness is often attributable to environmental factors or experiences beyond people's con control. Um, so many of the characters are multidimensional. Uh, Boo, of course, obviously, but also more minor characters like Miss Caroline, the, uh, the teacher, who uh, insists that Scout not read because she's got some method that she wants to teach by. And so Atticus and Scout form a pact that they're going to secretly read at night. But Miss Carolyn is hurt and upset by the way the students treat her. Um, but it, uh, but that, become, that comes from her um, sort of misunderstanding and her condescension towards the students. Um, Walter Cunningham, the, the, the young boy who comes to a house for dinner, which is, of course, what we would typically call lunch in the middle of the school day. And he eats all his, all the food in sort of a rude way. Um, Miss DuBose, who's the cantankerous, angry, and unredeemably racist lady, but she turns out to be addicted to morphine and suffering from conditions beyond her control. And she leaves Jim a camellia after her death, even though uh, Jim destroyed all our camellias. So all these characters are multidimensional and complex, and they're not just very uh, simplistically good or simplistically bad. Um, and I think that a lot of the appeal of this novel comes from these major themes that appear in it, themes of justice, community, uh, racism, the imperfectibility of human nature, uh, class structure or stratification, empathy. Empathy is so important a subject that it came up when Barack Obama Express, express that trait as necessary for a Supreme Court nomination. And of course, that's what is at the heart of Atticus, uh, Atticus's admonition that you step into somebody's shoes and walk around in it for a while. You see things from their point of view. That's precisely what, um, what empathy is all about. Um, there are uh, 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 other figures like, um, uh, you know, like, like Boo, who is, of course, central to the story. And Boo is uh, sort of a, a phantom-like menace is the way he's described early on. And he becomes increasingly human to Scout and to Jim. Um, he leaves them Indian head pennies, gum, a pocket watch, wood carved figures in the knot hole of a tree. He mends and folds Jim's pants. Uh, when Nathan Radley allegedly shoots at a prowler, um, but it was actually Jim who's uh, going onto the Radley property. And then Boo drapes his blanket over Scout without her noticing while Miss Maudie's house is on fire. Um, there's a lot to say about gender in, in the novel, um, and uh, uh, Mayela Ewell, um, and then all uh, uh, figures from Miss Motti to Anne Alexandria to Stephanie Cropper to Calpurnia, um, each contribute different uh, notions of femininity, femininity in, in, in Maycomb and uh, present uh, different portrayals of women that are very uh, complex. I think uh, the novel appeals obviously to lawyers who want to elevate uh, um, Atticus to sort of a, a, an, a, an idol sort of standard. But I also think, and this may be controversial to say, but this, this book appeals to sort of the white savior complex. Um, so there are people of good faith on the left and well-meaning progressive who wish to see themselves as uh, their white, white people who wish to see themselves as Atticus Finch is applauded by blacks as he leaves the courtroom. Um, even if this projection is ironically uh, racist in its paternalism. Um, so uh, uh, the book, I think, appeals, uh, I guess, if I could, uh, it could be sort of in short, it would be those, those major themes 
um, and, uh, and then the um, coming to age element of, of the story. And then uh, the, the fact that it was published you know, in 1960 during the rise of the civil rights movement makes its dealing with um, racism and the law particularly resonant. That was a very uh, charged moment in American history. And this book becomes somewhat representative of things that were going on uh, during that time. Uh, I have much more I would like to say, but, but time is running way faster than I thought. Um, I would like to say one note of, about uh, um, Go Set a Watchman, which was written first before To Kill Mockingbird, but of course published much later, only in, in recent years. And I think that book's portrayal of Atticus is um, more complex, but also uh, perfectly compatible with the Atticus Finch of To Kill a Mockingbird. And I think that both books ought to be taught alongside one another, because although uh, To Kill a Mockingbird is probably superior in its literary style and quality, uh, Ghost at a Watchman adds elements to Atticus's character and to Scout's character and to the uh, story that complicate things and make our reading of, uh, force our readings of To Kill a Mockingbird to be more nuanced. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, lovely. And I'm going to go on now to ask a Professor Metros if you would be so kind. Thank you, David. And Alan, thanks for those comments. You'll see there'll be some intersection between what you said and what I have to say as well. Uh, again, thanks for the invitation to speak to you all today uh, about this book that I love and I've taught many, many times. Um, I think what I want to do is address the prompt that Chris Kendall first sent to us when he invited us and hoped that we'd join him which was what makes this a, a great American novel. I mean, this is part of a series about great American novels. So I thought, let's, let's use that as a, as a, a jumping point and, and get some discussion on this book. Uh, what I want to do is walk us to the answer yes, but I'll start with no. Um, and I'm going to do that just to have a little fun and maybe uh, provoke some discussion during our Q&A. But determining what a great novel is or what a great American novel is, it's going to be based upon the criteria you're going to use for, for greatness. And so if we just say randomly pick something like all great novels have some kind of technical innovation to them. They, they do something to the genre that other novels haven't done before. So you have Moby Dick, which is this compendium of different genres than a single novel. Um, comes into something even more subtle, like the free and direct speech of Pride and Prejudice, right, that Jane Austen uses. Uh, the Inventiveness of Sun Also Rises or Absalom Absalom, which are two different kinds of books, but are technically just way ahead of what people are doing and imagining a novel can do. So if we're thinking about a great novel does something to the craft itself and shows a new way forward, uses language, uses words in a way that open up all kinds of possibilities, if that's our criteria, then no. I mean, To Kill a Mockingbird then doesn't rank with those kinds of technical achievements. It doesn't have to, but it certainly doesn't if we're gonna use that as a measuring stick for greatness. Um, but that's okay, that doesn't have to be our, our only measuring stick. I think it's a fine novel, I think it's really well written. For years I told students it's really impressive for a first novel, now I have to say it's really impressive for a second novel, right? We all know this was her second shot. Um, but it's a great book, but it doesn't really meet the standards of those other books. So if we use another one, and this is why I'm interested to see what we do during our Q&A. Um, great novel has uh, literary influence. Um, it situates itself in a particular kind of tradition. It doesn't tell a new story that no one else has told before, but it takes its subject matter and writes about it in a different kind of way. Um, and that you can sense from that novel forward, there are other books that connect back to it. So again, I'll always re re refer to Faulkner on something like this. I mean, Absalom Absalom is a plantation novel. People have been writing plantation novels for decades, right? But when Faulkner writes the plantation novel, all of a sudden, all new kinds of possibilities open up for that kind of work. And you can see other works in its wake being influenced by what Faulkner did. Um, same kind of thing for a more modern novel like Beloved. It's a fugitive slave narrative. People have been writing fugitive slave narratives for 150 plus years. But she does something with that particular subject that opens up that subject matter in a way that you can start to see a direct heritage to other writers. And so you can look at Faulkner and go, oh, Faulkner, Styron, Morrison, McCarthy. You can look at Morrison and go, Morrison, Ward, Whitehead. I, I get a great writer, a great book, 
kind of bequeaths to us other books. I'm not sure we can make that kind of direct kind of correlation coming out of To Kill a Mockingbird, as great a novel as it is. I detect literary influences on it, and I can see its influences on other writers, but it hasn't created a series of other books that in themselves great novels that build off of what she's done. I mean, she's writing a protest, social protest novel or a civil rights novel. Um, other people have done that before. She does it very well, but I don't get the sense that there's a great heritage of books that are born out of To Kill a Mockingbird. So maybe on that way, there's some greatness, but really, if you look at it and say, a novel like Maltese Falcon might be a greater novel than To Kill a Mockingbird if we're looking at what kind of heritage comes out of a single work. But if we step back and we just say to ourselves, reach, impact, and subject matter, it's a masterpiece. It is an absolute masterpiece for reaching an audience, impacting that audience, and talking about things that matter. Like Alan said, there are any number of universal themes in here that people can, can connect to. And so if we're thinking about in terms of of, of reach. I mean, last I counted or saw it was 40 million and, and growing for the number of books sold. Who knows, right? Add in the number of books borrowed from a library, add in the number of poor ninth grade kids who have to share copies of the book that someone's been reading in their classroom for 20 years. Uh, it could be double that, right? It, it could be 80 million people have, have read the novel. So as far as reach goes, there's, there's almost very few works that can compare to the reach. But with that reach comes impact. And as Alan mentioned, any number of people have talked about the influence that this book has had on their lives. Uh, for better or worse, it's given us a lot more lawyers, right? I think we can agree that any number of lawyers will tell you this was the book that inspired them to, to want to pursue the profession. And I think for all the right reasons, right? But throughout the years, there's been all kinds of polls that have been done. The very famous 1991 Book of the Month Club poll books that have changed your life. Number one is the Bible. Number four was To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, you know, it's up there in pretty good, pretty good company. Uh, the BBC's done any number of polls about books that have impacted lives. And in, in England, it's either Pride and Prejudice or To Kill a Mockingbird. It's remarkable. When you ask people, are there books that change people's lives? It's, it's always in the top one, two, three, or four. So, you know, we all know this, not every bestseller is a great novel, right? And not every great novel is a, is a bestseller. I mean, there are many great novels that don't sell well or it takes a while for them to sell. Um, but rarely do we have a novel here that's sold well. So it's got that reach that a great novel has to have, but it's also clearly, it's had a profound impact upon its readers and a profound impact for the good. Um, I think Alan mentioned the idea of empathy. Any number of people have testified to how this book made people want to get inside the skin of another person and see things from their point of view, that it transformed the way they thought about what it meant to be a good person. In a way, it's kind of a classical Aristotelian virtue narrative. We watch Atticus be a good person and we watch Scout learn how to be a good person through Atticus. And then we as readers, by watching a person be, be a good person, want to be that good person ourselves. And although any number of novels have affected readers, I don't think there's another book that has had that kind of effect that really has made people want to be better people. Um, and so on reach and impact, it is up there with the great achievements in, in American literature. But couple that, couple those two things with its subject matter, right? And as Alan pointed out, it hits on any number of universal themes, but really it takes on the great theme of American literature, right? Race and racial justice. Uh, there are others. I remember in graduate school, we all read R.W.B. Lewis's American Adam, right? That the defining American narrative was the individual person who set himself or herself at odds with social convention. And that became a dominant idea in our literature. But from the very beginning, we have wrestled with this question of race and racial justice. And so with a book like To Kill a Mockingbird, we have a book with massive reach, profound impact, and dealing with one of the most important subjects in our history and in our literature. If we run from Last the Mohicans, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, Huck Finn, Marrow Tradition, right? Sound and the Fury, Native Son, Visible Man, Confessions of Nat Turner, Beloved, so many of our great works 
have wrestled with this question. And Harper Lee does so in this book that's had this profound impact and reach. So I think if we put all of those things together, a lot of people have read it. A lot of lives have been changed by it. And it talks about some of the most important things we can be talking about as a nation. Now we're talking about an American classic, right? We're talking about a true masterpiece. Um, so at this point, we have to kind of ask ourselves, and this is what Chris prompted us in, in one of the emails, to think about what it says about race and racial justice. And I think we can only hint at it here and then maybe do more in the Q&A. Um, I don't want to make a definitive statement because I want to hear what other people have to say about this as well. But I think the enduring power of the book is the complex way that it talks about race and justice. And that's not a word that you often hear used with The Kill a Mockingbird, right? But in many ways, people don't praise it for its complexity. Um, in fact, they kind of praise it and also condemn it for its straightforward, very clear moral message, right? That Atticus Finch is a hero, right? He is a hero because he defends what is right, no matter what it costs him or his family. He does so against the conventions of his town and community, but he follows his own conscience to do what is right and to call others to do what is right. It's that kind of moral message that was very timely in 1960. Like Alan said, we have to remember when this book was published. And so part of that appeal is not simply what she's writing about, but when she's writing about this. At a time when I think that kind of moral message was very appealing and very much needed, right? That we needed figures of moral courage who understood what was right and would be willing to take these kinds of risks. And that's why uh, in his 1964 memoir, Martin Luther King singles out Atticus Finch as an example of moral courage for not just Southerners, but for all Americans. But that's not a complex message, right? That was praising it for having this very, very straightforward moral message. Now, the downside of that is that's the very kind of moral message that the novel's detractors have latched onto. Like Alan says, the white savior narrative. One of the reasons for teaching this book is because it gives us a moral paradigm in someone like Atticus Finch. One of the reasons for moving past this book and not teaching it anymore is it gives a very particular kind of moral hero, one that whose time has passed and that we really kind of, we need a better kind of hero than this book presents to us. But whether you praise the book for its moral vision or condemn the book for its moral vision, most people look at it like, well, it has a very clear, straightforward message on race and racial justice. And that message comes through in a very clear portrayal of Atticus Finch and what we're supposed to think about him. And what I want to kind of suggest and as I wrap this up is maybe use one example. The novel is much more complex than this. And I agree with Alan. I actually think to, that um, Ghost Set of Watchmen makes us much better readers of To Kill a Mockingbird, much better readers of that novel. Because if you go back and you start rereading this book and realize this book was written by the same person who wrote Ghost Set of Watchmen, then you begin to see the complexity with which she characterizes Atticus. Let me give one example. and I'll, I'll wrap it up with this, and maybe this leads to Q&A. The highlight of the novel for many people is when Atticus is leaving the courtroom. All the African-Americans in the balcony stand. Reverend Sykes tells Scout, stand, your father's passing. For many people, the heroic moment of the book, Atticus being celebrated. For many people, the nadir of the book, the white savior being celebrated as the hero of the book. However you want to think about that, the most important stuff in the book happens after that scene. For instance, Atticus and Jem in chapter 23 actually get into some interesting conversations about what a just legal system looks like. It's not in the movie. It's rarely discussed by critics when they do the book, but go back and look at those scenes. Jem is crying. He is angry. He is frustrated. He tells Miss Maudie, it's like waking up out of a cocoon. Quote, I thought Makeham folks were the best folks in the world. What he's realizing was Alan pointed out. He lives in a town full of really hateful people. He really does. And he's becoming, he's, and, and what they will do to perpetuate that injustice shocks Jem. And he has a series of conversations with his father right after the trial. And his father's telling him, it'll be okay. We have an appeal. We'll do the best we can. And Jim is furious. And he says, this is not right. And his dad says, I know it's not right. And, and we'll probably do the same thing again, over and over again. But you have to trust the system. 
And Jim was like, no, in fact, we, we need to get rid of juries. We've got to throw people off juries. We've got to put women on juries. We got to, and he's going through this whole diatribe about we need a whole new system in place. And Atticus keeps responding with, it's not the system. We, we can tweak this. We can get this to work. We just need to change people's hearts and minds a little bit. And there and toward the end of the book, there's all kinds of interesting tension, intergenerational tension between someone like Atticus, whose position is the way forward is not to throw out the system. The way forward is to make this system work for the people it's supposed to work for. Jem's response seems to be the opposite. Until we change the system dramatically, nothing will happen. And the end of the book keeps raising these little issues about what progress looks like. And I'm not saying what Harper Lee is telling us is Atticus Finch is wrong. We are to admire what he's done. But also, I think, we're to see the limits of what he's able to do based upon the way he sees how justice works. And so I would argue that the greatness of the novel not only is about how it handles that theme, but because it handles the theme of race and justice so complexly that I think it will have an enduring appeal. In the end, we don't need a better book than To Kill a Mockingbird to talk about race. I just think we need to become better readers of that book. If we do, I think we'll be fine. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, may I please ask uh, Professor Noble? Uh, you're still muted. Uh, sir. Am I now unmuted? Yeah. Yes. Good, good. Well, I will now maneuver my way through <laughs> a discussion of To Kill a Mockingbird and try not to repeat some of the things that have been said, which are, of, of course, they are exactly the right things to say. They needed to be said, and you said them first. <laughs> but let me start with this. This is the book that Salem Press in Massachusetts asked me to edit 11 years ago. It's uh, Critical Insights, Essays on To Kill a Mockingbird, and Chris is in it. So he's perfectly familiar with it. When I set about making this book, I read all the articles there were in 2001 on To Kill a Mockingbird. There were not as many as you would think. If you had been doing a book, I had been doing a book on a Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man or or um, a Hemingway story, there would have been a lot more. It turns out, um, as has been suggested, that this is not a book that needs a lot of explaining. At least it was not thought to be 11 years ago, a book that needed a lot of explaining. Another point to, to, uh, to maybe emphasize something that Chris said, there is only one essay in this book that relates Mockingbird to other books. There is an essay in in the Salem book <clears> that talks about Mockingbird read in conjunction with Faulkner and how the, the, the various uh, themes and, and procedures in Mockingbird, if you read it first, would actually help you in understanding what Faulkner did with a much more complex surface, at least. The, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a prejudice that's run along, and I, I, I'm sure it was Chris, at least Chris, who said it, and that is, what is the relationship between popularity and quality? Well, it's a weird one. Uh, the Sun Also Rises and The Great Gatsby and Look Homer and Angel were bestsellers, you know, and, they, and they're really good. There's no absolute, uh, a bestseller doesn't have to be not very good. And obviously, as Alan said, uh, a lot of very, very good books never get to be bestsellers. The reason for this book, the reason this book existed at all, was that the Salem Publishing Company decided on a peculiar strategy for selling books. And these days, everybody is trying to come up with another better strategy for selling books. What they did with this book and with a whole series of books, I did four for them, but this, this critical insight series, a high school or a small college or even the University of Alabama bought one copy of this book and then received the computer code for accessing the text. And the reason for this was that, that the people at Salem learned that there were schools around the country, loads and loads, where say the entire ninth grade was being asked to write term papers on To Kill a Mockingbird. 
Well, the first little eager beaver girl would run down to the library and take out the Kill a Mockingbird, if there was one copy, or in a college, somebody would run and take out all the, hide all the critical essays on To Kill a Mockingbird, and then nobody else could do their term papers. So the point here was that you could have any number of people at any number of computer stations doing term papers on To Kill a Mockingbird simultaneously. Now, whether this turned out to be a gold mine for the Salem Publishing Company, I do not know. But since they only intended to sell one copy to each institution, I was not paid by royalties. So that was not my concern. It, it is um, one of the, some of these essays are touched on by Chris and, and would have, I think maybe were by Alan, who apparently more interested in, in the law than most of us. A lot of the complaining essays that find fault with Mockingbird, a lot of them have to do with Atticus's lawyer. People think a, a lot of strange things about Atticus's career as a state legislator. He should have put legislation into the hopper in Montgomery outlawing Jim Crow. Um, he should be more active in, in various kinds of civil rights uh, activities and so on. And then I don't think either one of us, any one of us mentioned this before. There are people who are very unhappy with not, with Atticus being willing to forego formal procedures when it came to uh, Boo Radley and the death of, of Bob Ewell at the end. This, this was taken badly by strict constructionists of, of how people deal with the law. And you would, in fact, it makes a kind of sense. Anyway, in the course of reading, I can't tell you how many articles. Uh, I think I kept 15 and read 100. I don't know if that, 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 was, the, that was the gist of it. Uh, there are complaints about Atticus's attitude toward the African-American community. And there are complaints about the depiction of the African-American community in Mockingbird. Well, you know, that's, we'll go along with that. Something that had been, had been on my mind a little bit, and this gave me an opportunity to pursue it, was that, that I had recently been looking again at Huckleberry Finn. And I had also, in, in the course of just thinking about Mockingbird over time, realized that there is, a, there is, there is some, there are shirkers there are people who have not joined the Mockingbird Club. The most famous non-member of the Mockingbird Club is this person. When I was 15, I would have loved it. O'Connor, Flannery O'Connor wrote to a friend at the time. I think for a child's book, it does all right. It's interesting that all the folks that are buying it don't know they're reading a child's book. Somebody ought to say what it is. Well, that's cranky Flannery O'Connor, and we'll, we'll take her, her opinion as we see fit. Maybe a little bit more heavy, have, of, of more weight in this discussion. When, when we put together in 1982, the history of Southern literature, I was, I had been 20 years earlier, a PhD student with Lewis Rubin, who was the chief editor of now this monster book, The History of Southern Literature. Now, he assigned, must be 40 different authors to do different chapters in the history of Southern literature. And my, my chapter is the next to the last one, which I wrote in 1982 called The Future of Southern Literature. Now imagine if you sat down today to write an essay called The History of, of the Future of Southern Literature, and it were, was then almost 40 years later. I look back from time to time to see how I did. I did like Lee Smith and Cormac McCarthy, I am proud to say. Some of the other people that I suggested were going to be really great turned out not to be. But I recently went to see what did 
the definitive work on the history of Southern literature have to say about Harper Lee? Let me tell you, Harper Lee in this book, To Kill a Mockingbird was of course her only book, is 16 lines long, one third of one page. It is in a section called the recent South. <clears throat> And those 16 lines, one third of a page, are given also exactly the same amount of time and space to Harris Downing, John Bell Clayton, and William Hoffman. The four of them are covered in two pages, about 16 or 17 lines apiece. It suggests here, of the writers focusing on racial tension and violence, none has achieved more recognition and respect than Harper Lee for her single novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. And then it has a, a little bit of a, a plot summary. And that is that one, well, about a third of one page, along with Harris Downey, John Bell Clayton, and William Hoffman. So we, we say a lot of nice things about To Kill a Mockingbird, but it is not universally thought. One of the things that occurs to me when I saw that, when it occurred to me over, over the years, really, is that, is that this business of labeling it a child's novel. Huckleberry Finn <clears throat> was originally, like Tom Sawyer, I suppose, like Tai P and Omu, maybe Moby Dick, uh, The Leather Stocking Tales. These, these were books that were originally put out into the public as books for boys or books for children. Huckleberry Finn moved very quickly from the category of a book for children to literary fiction and really serious stuff. In some ways, um, there is still <laughs> something of a debate about, about Harper Lee. Well, recently, and this is especially my, my fellow Alabamians will know this very, very well. Um, Alan Ribbon down in uh, Auburn University in Montgomery decided that the N-word in Huckleberry Finn was absolutely unacceptable. And he went through and counted that the N-word, which I cannot say on, in this broadcast, occurs in Huckleberry Finn 218 times. So New South Books, as I'm sure both of you know very well, put out this, call it what you want, expurgated, modularized, changed version of both Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. Here is Alan Gribben's explanation. <clears throat> The N-word remains inarguably the most inflammatory word in the English language. And it cannot appear in print under any circumstances. It will not be allowed. And I, I, I'm perfectly sure that we all, we all know that you, you, your career would be over should you even inadvertently say such thing on stage or on television or on the radio or wherever. It's just really not done. It's really not done. So I picked up Mockingbird and I decided to do a little investigation of my own. And you may or may not realize that the N-word appears in To Kill a Mockingbird 48 times, 48 times. It is sometimes in quotes, that is to say, uh, Atticus will say, will quote somebody and say, we, we shouldn't say that. But it is often not in quotes. Scout says it, uh, Mrs. DeBose says it a lot. Mayel, Mayella says it a lot. Ewells all say it a lot. Cecil Jacobs at school says it. But any number of times, Scout says it straightforwardly in her regular discourse. Sometimes it appears four times on this. There are places in the book where the N-word appears four times on the same page. Now, to paraphrase 
the great Walter Percy in his essay, The Message in the Bottle. I find it remarkable that no one finds this remarkable. Why, why does 48, why is it that 48 uses of that word in Mockingbird seem to have attracted almost no hostility? It is, of course, because the book is overwhelmingly positive and virtuous. And, and no one doubts the good heart of, of Atticus or Scout. Oh, by the way, a, a side note, here's a, here's a completely irrelevant item. It is my opinion now that Mockingbird has gotten a good boost from the last 10 or 15 years of fame for Truman Capote. I think people now are more interested in Dill than they ever were in 1960, 61, 62, 63. We didn't know then. I mean, I was 20 when the book came out. So, you know, it, it's, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was a grown man when, when this book was published. But we had no idea in the world that there was a Truman Capote figure in the novel. Now, Capote has become such a, such a, um, a, a cult figure, such a, such a, a cultural icon. That we that you don't you can't teach the book you can't you can't talk about the book without people saying yeah and that deal you know that was based on Truman Capote who went there in the summers because his parents didn't want him and so on and so on and Capote has done worlds for this I have developed a kind of thesis here about Huckleberry Finn and and uh, Mockingbird kind of comparative study in a in a sense. One of, the, one of the things that's true for both, but well, several things are true for both books. One is that the, the composition history of each book is amazingly parallel. You know the story of Harper Lee giving up, revising, and then in fact, the ghost set of Watchmen, that material taken out, other, people, other material put in, put, it, put in, uh, put in, and then at one point she throws the manuscript out her apartment window and it lands in the alley. Well, the, there's a whole book on the composition history of Huck Finn. And it's amazingly similar in that Twain wrote along, got stuck, stopped for 18 months, started again, gave up, went back. And we all know that the ending is unsatisfactory. We all know that after the raft passes Cairo, Illinois, that they're headed south when they should have gone up the Ohio River and so on. The books also have these children, that each book has a child as a narrator. Uh, Huck grows to be 14. The book, each book, by the way, inside the book, not only does each book take several years to write, but the elapsed plot time in each book is much greater than the reader knows or, or feels. The plot time in Huck Finn is like three years. It doesn't seem that, but people have gone and counted. Every now and then Huck says some, something like, we floated along then for seven months, you know, it's not, it's not, doesn't come up in your face, but it is several years. And the same thing is true quietly in Mockingbird. She's in the, she's, she's starts first grade and pretty soon she's in the third grade and, you know, time, time passes. The, 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 the two books each talk about the difference between childhood innocence and adult in, in, in religious terms. Is there original sin or not? Um, how do people become corrupted? Do they become corrupted simply by growing older or does society corrupt individuals? Well, Twain was best, that was best explained in Huck Finn by Henry Nash Smith with a, one, which, with a wonderful essay a million years ago called uh, the, Deform, the Sound Heart and the Deformed Conscience. And what he, when he talks about Huck, he says the conscience of an individual is shaped by his culture. His conscience, what he takes to be right and wrong, is shaped by his culture. But if he really, really has a sound, enduring, strong heart, his heart, which is to say his feelings, will overcome his intellectualizing. And this is Huck Finn's great triumph it's great triumph he feels guilty when um when he refused well he, he has to come to I'll, I'll get to this in a second but he feels 
his conscience bothers him. At one point when he's on the raft, at first he plays a trick on Jim, you know, and, and with the hat and Jim is bewitched and blah, blah, blah. He doesn't feel bad about it at all. Later though, when he, when he plays that terrible trick on Jim on the raft in the storm, he says later, I went and humbled myself. I went and apologized and I'm glad I did it too. He, nobody told him to do it. It was the workings of his fine heart that caused him to go and apologize to Jim. Later, he's thinking about writing the note. He writes the note that will turn Jim back in. And he is, after all, an escaped slave. Um, he decides against it. His heart tells him he can't. And he tears up the note and he says, all right, then I'll go to hell. He actually thinks in terms of this huge uh, eternal sacrifice that he might be making. Well, when you get into Mockingbird, the kids, the kids there, and, and what Harper Lee is doing there, he, she calls racism, well, Atticus tells the kids, conscience is something you will develop and as you grow up, you will, you will, if you're a good person, you will establish a conscience and you will, you will develop feelings of right and wrong that will last you the rest of your life. In the meantime, though, children have, and I think Alan hit on this briefly, there is a Wordsworthian, um, Blakean dimension to this. The children are innocent. Now, how long are you will children innocent? How long are Cunningham children innocent? At what point do they catch the make them disease, which is racism? Well, in each household, presumably the infant begins as trailing clouds of glory from that place which was his home. But if his home is the Yule house, He's going to be corrupted fairly soon. It, and, and if his home is, is the Fitch house, he may very well live quite a long time being nurtured. I mean, here's my last complicated point. Huck gets through every crisis absolutely on his own. You're already smiling because I'm going to say, what Huck just really could use would be a dad. A mentor. Well, he had a dad, Pap. And Pap is about the awfulest father, if not the awfulest human being in most of American literature. Every single triumph of, of heart and goodwill and brotherhood, every triumph of Huck Finn is a triumph he has to achieve absolutely on his own. In Mockingbird, nothing. There, Mockingbird is a, is a fiesta of mentors. It's a fiesta of explanations. You want to know why not to kill a mockingbird? Well, there's two people there to tell you. You want to, does, does Walter Cunningham have bad table manners? Calpurnia will straighten you out on that. Are, do you want to know why, why uh, there are no women on, on uh, uh, juries? Atticus explains, why is make them the way it is? And Alexandra has the answer. There's every step of the way where one of the children has a query. One of those things that Huck Finn had better figure out for himself, Mrs. Uh, Maudie comes in and helps. Calpurnia comes in and helps. And I went through the book just for fun, you know to see how many times, I, I wrote them all down too. I have pages and pages of mentoring here. <laughs> there, every time anybody has a question about what's right or what's wrong or what to do or what to avoid doing, about two people jump up and say, now, the answer to that is, <laughs> and the mentors pop in and explain it. Uh, it are, are people all rotten? No, they're good when you get to know them. Well, how do you, how do you get to know them? Well, you have to walk a mile in their shoes. And I mean, there's, it is in, in the 250 pages or whatever your volume is, there must be 25 places where a, where a conundrum, a moral dilemma, 
um, why can't I hit my classmate in the mouth if, <laughs> if, if, if she really is acting up? Well, now, here are the reasons why we don't do that. It is incredible how, how, how often and how thoroughly Jim and Scout are mentored, instructed, properly, properly advised and raised. And it, it, it ends, I think, the, 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 great, the, the great power of Huck Finn is watching this isolated, and he's in, he is, a, I think, our first existential hero. He is, a, he is an isolato in, in, in the United States. He is just, he, he's on that raft and he's a part of nothing. And it might be, it might be interesting to think, compare that to how thoroughly integrated actually the Finches are into the community. I mean, they know everybody and everybody knows them. Huck finally, in a sense, gives up on the idea of moving into society. And he says, whether he can or not, I reckon I got to light out for the territory and speculate on which university, Auburn or Alabama, and which law school Jem and Scout will go to before they become very, very solid Rotarians somewhere in Greensboro or, or Selma. That's it for now. I'm, but anyway, if there's responses, I'll, I'll live with it. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Uh, so thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to go now to the questions and answers chat buttons. And again, I encourage everyone in the audience, put in your questions. Um, now we have a question already from Amy Lindsay. Do you feel that the reach of To Kill a Mockingbird was because it was made into a movie and picked up for classroom curricula or because of the book itself? chicken and egg. And then a follow-up, just to get us into the headlines. How do you all feel about seeing this great American novel banned as it gets looped in today's, you know, CRT culture war controversy? Um, and then, you know, makes me just want to weep, particularly when one could look at it from the ironic white savior point of view, as the first speaker noted. So uh, uh, comments to any and all parts of that. I'll, I'll... I'll jump in. I don't mind jumping in. I uh, I definitely think the film contributed to its the book's popularity. Obviously, Gregory Peck was a major figure and highly uh, recognizable and very famous. And uh, and people associate him with Atticus Finch. I mean, even I can't watch another movie with Gregory Peck in it without thinking, oh, what's Atticus Finch doing in this movie? Um, so there's that. Th there's definitely that. Um, the Critical race theory question is interesting because this book has been banned for a long time. I mean, it's been banned decade after decade for different reasons. Yeah. Um, the most recent article I read calling for this ban was titled, uh, Why It's Time Schools Stop Teaching to Kill a Mockingbird. And it's not, uh, it's not maybe, it's not what you would suspect. This is maybe an article that's, I don't know, five years old, if I had to guess. Um, but the, the, the argument was that the book reifies and reinforces racism um, and that it perpetuates white supremacy by celebrating what is ultimately an inadequate resolution to racial strife and injustice. That people read To Kill a Mockingbird and think, ah, I feel good about myself. I'm going to, you know, go empathize with people and that's great, close the book, done, my work, you know, my work toward racial justice is over. And, and so that uh, the argument I've seen is more one lately that has come from the left saying, A, bringing up the, the use of the N-word that, that Don uh, mentioned, but also uh, that the, the book is sort of unsatisfying as a uh, step toward progress and that um, it is part of the systemic racism in that regard, that it is, uh, it does not un adequately or sufficiently undo some of the systemic racism that is out there. So I've, I've actually seen the calls for banning To Kill a Mockingbird coming from that perspective. I don't know what the, you know, I don't know what perspectives the, 
the, the questioner had in mind, but uh, I'm just throwing out that that's the most recent one that I've actually seen in print. I'll just, I'll, I'll jump in to add to that real quickly. A um, lot of conversations with my students about this recently. I mean, it's, it's hard to read a book nowadays without this critical race theory kind of background informing the way they respond to it. Um, yeah, I just often tell students that um, he's not a white savior. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he does, in many ways, if you read the book carefully, he doesn't win the case. He doesn't change a lot of hearts. He does, he does seem to change Link D's heart a little bit and Mr. Underwood, who writes a pretty good editorial. But the, the second part of the book, or the, the last third of the book, often emphasizes how little things have changed in makeup. In fact, there are almost direct phrases like this. And even Atticus says of Jim to Scout, don't worry, sooner or later he'll forget about Tom Robinson and the whole town will. Um, I think we, we just don't notice those lines until we reread them now. I just think that while Atticus is to be admired, there's no doubt about that. I agree with what Don said. I mean, there's no doubt that Harper Lee's heart is in the right place and Atticus's heart in the right place. But again, I think it's just much more complicated that what Atticus is trying to do and what Atticus is trying to achieve. And I think that Harper Lee in that book is praising him for what he's able to accomplish. But I do not think that we're supposed to hold him up uncritically. To read the novel critically is to not disrespect the novel. I think the novel is a, in its particular time and place, we may have overread our admiration for Atticus and overread perhaps what Arbor Lee was saying. I think now with maybe some distance of time, I think we can look at it and say, I mean, Atticus Finch is very much a man of his age, um, but in every response to that, he is constantly trying to do what he believes is the right thing to do. So I just tell my students on this, there might be people who look at an Atticus Finch nowadays and read him one way. But again, you being of a particular time and moment helps you read things better. Also, being of a particular time and the moment creates blind spots that you cannot see. So I just don't think that we're necessarily better people now than we were 60 years ago. And we can see the novel better. Our discussions are different. Our context is different. Our national story is different. But I don't agree with those people who think there's a better book than To Kill a Mockingbird to talk about these things. Like I said before, I just think we can revisit it and just read it a little better than we have in the past. So that's all. I, I did a, a little bit of research back a while ago and a couple of things that are really pretty obvious. When the manuscript uh, got finished and it was sent to the publisher, the publisher loved it. When it was published, the reviewers loved it. When the Pulitzer Prize Committee read it, they loved it and they gave it the, they gave it the prize and it hit the bestseller list and it stayed on the bestseller list for weeks and months before there was a movie. Now, that there is no doubt about the movie, boy. <laughs> that, if you write a book and Gregory, Gregory Beck makes the movie, that is a good thing. And it sold, I'm sure it was, a, it was just a, a turbo thrust of, of attention and advertising. And, it, and, it's an, and by luck, it is an excellent movie. But, but looking back from the day before the release of the movie to the day of, of, the, of the novel, of the publication of the novel, everything was full speed ahead uh, in terms of the publication, the reviews and the prize winning and, best, and, and the uh, sales, everything was go. So it didn't rescue uh, uh, an obscure, it does happen that movies rescue obscure books, but not this time. Uh, I have a question for you from Jeffrey Crossler. Um, how should we understand the accusation and trial in the context of today's Me Too movement, as in Believe the Woman? We're, we're just going to stick with current events. I mean, it's a good book, even if you don't have current events, but clearly current events are the way to go for the, our questioners. Well, okay, actually, let, so let me redo this. Have you had people who, have you taught the class differently since 2000, what, 16 or whenever, 17, whenever it was that the Me Too movement came out? Have you used it to criticize or to critique the Me Too movement? Does it, in point of fact, speak in ways that are helpful for that? I mean, have, have you adjusted your own teaching to take account of the moment? Well, I guess if you think about what happened, I mean, Mayella Yule is a victim no matter what, whether, you know, I mean, she's, she's a victim of, uh, 
I mean, it's pretty clear of her father's uh, uh, abuse. And, and so she is testifying under coercion. And, you know, I'm not sure, I guess I'm not sure, I mean, maybe the, the question is maybe meant to be provocative, but I, I'm not sure it really changes the fact that, you know, I guess in, in this novel, I don't see how, the, how that really affects the reading of, of the particular, um, you know, trial in, in the novel, but I'd be interested in hearing maybe more about why the, the questioner thinks, you know, the, the reading of the particular scene would be different. Yeah, I mean, I've, yeah, I've taught To Kill a Mockingbird probably two or three times or, or the film post Me Too movement. Uh, as I also often teach about the Emmett Till case, which is another classic example of a, a woman not telling the truth on the stand. Um, but it, does, it doesn't come up. I mean, in other words, we talk about context. I've never had a student say, in relationship to what we're talking about, how does that particularly apply to a Me Too movement? So that, if you're at the question is, how would we address that or, or has it come up? It, it hasn't come up in any kind of discussion I've ever had about the novel. I could see it coming up and simply saying, well, yes, it's clear that Mayella is not telling the truth in the context of the Emmett Till trial. It's clear that Carolyn Bryan is not telling the truth. People often don't tell the truth on the stand. Yeah, it, you don't have to be Socrates either to, to figure out why she lies. I mean, it, you, you could walk a mile in her bare feet and you know that She's she's literally saving her own life. I mean, her father is a dangerous character. I mean, she's shamed. She's afraid. I mean, she lies because she really has to lie. I guess you would say in order to es escape the moment she's in. And we we should yes, she lies. <laughs> it is wrong to believe her, but you can certainly, um, as Atticus would say, you can certainly understand with compassion, why she, she does what she does. And she is a racist after all. I mean, um, she's not, she isn't, she, she, her, her affection for Tom is not, is not um, pure at heart. So I have a question um, from, and by the way, the question where I'm going to encourage people from the audience to keep on doing stuff so, because I'm resorting to a question of my own. It's terrible. So I'm a New York reader. When I read it, of course, it's this is the South generic. How much is this an Alabama novel? How much is it a Monroeville novel? How much are there elements that readers from other states in the South get wrong because they wrongly assimilated to their own state or local experience? What about it is more local and statal and precise than just a Southern novel? Well, I, I mean, just historically, there are certain antecedents that she's addressing. I mean, the, everyone thinks about the Scottsboro Boys trial, but, um, but Lee's father represented um, two men, I believe it was two men who were accused of a crime and I cannot recall the circumstances of the crime or what happened, but there is sort of a biographical a point of reference that she would have had in mind, um, you know, that, and obviously everybody links A.C. Lee to uh, Atticus. So adding that historic, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, historical detail to it um, is very specifically Alabama. Now, whether you could say, you know, could you take this story and move it to Georgia or to Mississippi or Tennessee and have it work? You, yeah, we, we probably could in that, you know, in that era. Yeah, I, 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 I think, I think, you know, it's not necessarily tied in that way to, to Alabama, but uh, I don't know, Don, Chris, would you all disagree with that? Yeah, I, I'll tell you what I think you could do. Um, and this is, you know, this sort of is an old arrangement of Southern literature into coastal Piedmont and mountain this this story could be the liberation of Lord Byron Jones, it, or or it could it, or it could have taken place. Uh, it could be Three Lives from Mississippi. It it can't be a port city. It can't be a mountain south. Mm -hmm. it, it can't even be a Mississippi River story. But any place 
where where the and, and, and um, I had a paragraph about this which I I forewent, but um, the it's the it's the isolation of Maycomb. It's so it's far from the landing. It's far from water. It's far from the river. It's far from everything. Even today, to get to Monroeville, there is no road. There are eight roads, and they're all wrong. <laughs> it's it. But you could go all around Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, South Carolina, Mississippi, and so on. And you go Louisiana might be a different cultural kind of thing, but through most of the most of the South and Mid South, talking about Tennessee and Kentucky. As soon as you got to a town that was not a Mobile or a Charleston or an Asheville, as soon as you got to a essentially an interior, isolated, small town, you could put, I think you could put, in a sense, Mockingbird there. No sailors, no ships going in and out of the port, <laughs> none of that kind of, no, no communication with the outside world. Interestingly, I've read recently where... Uh, based on Lee's description of Finch's Landing in Macomb County, where they lie, they're, they're actually that there's no place where that could have been up. It's, there's nothing on the Alabama River that would be where, she, so it's just totally discombobulated geographically. It just doesn't fit on the map. Yeah, and just to kind of add to what Don was saying, I think the only in joke in the book that people are not going to get is the joke about Miss Caroline because she's from North Alabama. Yeah, the joke about North Alabama is full of liberals and steel interest and big mules or Republicans and people of other ill repute. Uh, it's probably the only, and that makes sense in Alabama because North Alabama is, is much different. It's the mountains, it's the hill country. Um, and so, but other than that, I agree with Don, it, uh, Black Belt, if it's, a, if it's part of the South where it's small town driven by kind of an agricultural economy, I think people get it. I mean, you know, but sweeping you down from North Carolina through South Carolina, Georgia, right. Atlanta. You could, that. Run that yeah. crescent. you could run that crescent all the way from Virginia yeah. right through Mississippi to the Mississippi River, the yeah. crescent that is not the coast, right. but, but what we loosely would call the Piedmont. Yeah. And that great crescent, you could put it anywhere in there or anywhere almost in, except in the mountains in yeah. Tennessee yeah. and Kentucky. Yeah, mountains and the coast. But otherwise, if you're in the Cotton Belt, I think, it, I think it's kind of, that makes, mm -hmm. it all makes sense. I don't think it has to be necessarily an Alabama novel. I have a question about reputation. Is its emergence to fame a testament to the power of Book of the Month Club America, which has since gone away, to be only partially replaced by Oprah book recommendations? You know, if it were written today, could it achieve the same popularity in terms of something for a popular audience with literary aspirations, but you know, it, it's not Finnegan's Wake? Uh, so that, that, that mid spot, sweet spot, which many people have said has decayed in our literary culture since then. Uh, let me, add, I can answer part of that. I mean, I have an answer for at least part of it. Um, something really unusual and important that has happened in the last 20 years in publishing is the the, the focus on the author and the author's responsibility to do, publicate, to do publicizing, to go on tour, to get on fresh air, to get on the radio, to get on television, to get on PBS. And, and the, the, writer, the writer is now responsible for, for a huge percentage of uh, what you would loosely call publicity. And any publisher will tell you that they don't advertise books in order to sell them. They advertise the books that sell. Now, which books sell? Well, the books that sell, first of all, you might get reviews, but reviews are sparse these days. Mm -hmm. And an awful lot of the a responsibility for the, for the um, uh, pushing and for the publicizing of any book is on the author. Now, <laughs> everybody knows the next paragraph here. Nell Harper Lee was not doing any of that. So if she were if if her, she had the same personality and she wrote a book today and the publisher says well we have a 22 city tour for you and you'll be interviewed three times a day hell no wouldn't handle it I mean she she had no she she would not have taken up that that responsibility other things other things can happen though there obviously there are 
monster book hits and they're not all they're not all genre i mean they're wonderful books that with a movie without a movie there are authors who sell millions of copies but if it were her responsibility to get on the road <laughs> and push the book god help it <laughs> and I, I think at the time david the uh... I, mean, I don't think there were four different book of the month clubs, but there, I think I read something that four different things like book of the month, yeah. whatever, adopted To Kill a Mockingbird. In other words, it was widely, I mean, it wasn't just book of the month club or what Reader's Digest, whatever. It was being promoted. It was being picked up by everybody. Um, so, of course, that certainly, it, it doesn't hurt. But like you say, the same thing when a Oprah or Reese, Reese Witherspoon or someone picks up your book. That's just the way the books get circulated now. I mean, I think a book has to stand on its own legs if it gets that initial publication uh, or at least that initial publicity. Um, but we've seen any number of books that are like uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Again, the help with Catherine Stockett that went through several. I think she said she tried to send it to 30 different publishers and couldn't get it. But then it got picked up by one of the book clubs or one of these book promoters, and it just took off like wildfire. So it could happen today to a book like To Kill a Mockingbird, because I think it continues to happen to certain books Anyway, they just get picked up. They get promoted by the right people. And then on the merits of the book itself, it takes off. But you, it's got to be a good book. Um, any number of books get pushed by these uh, reading clubs that don't really take off the way that a book, a book like To Kill a Mockingbird did. So. Yeah, we do have these phenomena, though. I mean, the help is certainly one. Mm -hmm. a, a few years ago, uh, John Barron, his, his, his monster book, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, Mm -hmm. It was on the bestseller list for two, two and a half, three years. Publisher wouldn't even put it in paperback. It was selling so well in hardcover. And, you know, it's a good book. But you think, well, what, what happened here? And then they made the movie and that sold more books. But it does still, it does still happen. And there's still sometimes good books. Mm -hmm. I'm going to actually seize from that bit about movie to a final question, I think before I ask you for like just some last com uh, summing up, well, uh, John Kern, how faithful was the movie to the major points in the book? Uh, did it miss any? And I'll push that to, can we do a good academic analysis of how the movie has a different message from that of the book? You know, what this tells us about Hollywood, blah, 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 you know, but is it in point of fact, a substantively different movie rather than a condensation? And if so, for any interesting reasons? Well, it's been a while since I've seen the film. I can say that there are definitely events. I mean, obviously, the, the, the house fire is not part of the movie, and there are things that are in the book that aren't in the movie. Um, I would say thematically, from my recollection, at least, the book is, I mean, the film is pretty faithful to the book. Yeah, I think that it, it uh, I think I once read that the 30% of the book is the trial, yep. the 60% of the movie is the trial. Yeah. That, I mean, even, even though it has those two narratives, the Boo Radley and Tom Robinson narratives, Horton Foote has decided to focus mainly on the Tom Robinson trial and frame it with the Boo Radley story. Um, I, I think it's it's a great film. And don't get me wrong. It's a wonderful film. It's a great performance, a great script. But I think it does focus more on Atticus as hero. And it, it, it elides past a lot of the things in the book that are really kind of fascinating, but they're only fascinating in a novel. They wouldn't be fascinating on screen. Um, like discussion between Jem and Atticus is really interesting. The discussion the school children have in the last couple chapters about Hitler and the Holocaust and Jews, I, that changes the whole tone of the book when these kids are talking about and they're talking about Jewish people and their whiteness. I mean, that is really complex stuff that Harper Lee's dealing with. The film just doesn't do that and probably shouldn't have done that. It would have kind of muddied the waters of a one hour and 30 minute film. So. There's a, a the, the simple rule is you, you can't show it all. And so things get left out. And then everybody, everybody has a different opinion on the value of the thing that was left out. No question about it. And, and what Chris said is perfectly right. The, um, some of the things that were left out, there's the fellow, who, Dolphus, mm -hmm. who he has, they talk about him at a distance. He's the fellow, he's drunk all the time and he lives in the, in the, in the black community and he has a, presumably a black wife and mixed race children. 
and he comes to town on Saturday and Scout learns that, I mean, everybody, everybody instructs Scout into in one way or another. This fellow even gives him a little, men, gives her a little mentoring. And he explains why, why he lives in the black community. And he explains why he pretends to be drunk because then all the white people will forgive him for living in the black community because he's drunk and doesn't know any better. Mm -hmm. That that kind of thing, you, you could make a separate movie, but but putting it in would have probably been a mistake. And uh, it's, and it's true. It's true for a lot of the school, the stuff at school. Um, you can't do much of that. You can't do a lot. You can't do everything. You have to pare down the, the the single thing about the movie, though, the single. This is a production problem, not a not a thematic problem. As I remember a million years ago going down to Monroeville and going for the first time into the courtroom. And it is that first time that'll open your eyes and you think, oh, this is really nice. This is where they shot the film. And I remember that, that wonderful uh, moment when somebody said, well, not exactly. You see, there are all these windows and Hollywood does not like natural light. Hollywood likes the light that it provides in exactly the right angle and, and amount. So they went all over the courtroom, took measurements of every millimeter and built one in Hollywood, identical to the one in Monroeville, really identical. And it's, uh, and it's really it's, it's interesting because when you're there, you think you're in the movie, but of course you sort of aren't because they sort of built a new one in, in LA. Uh, so uh, movies are make-believe. Mm -hmm. You are reminding me, of course, that the answer for every great novel is make a TV series out of it. Now that TV <laughs> series are being all literary and ambitious. I am waiting. Episode limited run, yes. <laughs> yes, I'm waiting for Samuel Richardson's Clarissa to be turned into a 10-year uh, miniseries. <laughs> On that note, if I could have for the three of you some final uh word, you know, like a minute or so, just you know, summing up thought, I guess the same order. Uh, Professor Mendenhall first. Well, I guess I'd just like to say I really enjoyed uh, this conversation and I appreciate Chris and Don for their contributions. I'm not sure there's anything profound I could add to our discussion about the novel at this stage, but I've really appreciated the conversation and, and glad that you uh, organized this, David. Or Chris Kendall, I should say, organized it. Kendall is not Randall. He is the one who gets all the credit. <laughs> well, credit to you today for being with us, David. But uh, same thing. I would just uh, let's continue to read the book. Uh, let's, con let's continue to read it um, as, as its context changes, as the nation changes, as our dialogue about race and justice continues to change. Uh, it is too important a book uh, to put aside. Um, it's, it's got wisdom. Uh, it had wisdom when it was published in the 60s. It had wisdom when people were attacking it for the first time in the 90s. It has wisdom. It has legs. Let's keep reading it. We'll be better for it. So let's, let's not put the novel aside. Yeah, all, all of this, and, and in a sense, what the, the uh, sensation that one has when one walks into the Monrillo courthouse for the first time, you think, wow, isn't this something? What happens, absolutely it happens to me at my age and, and to some lesser degree, you too, is that it, it becomes increasingly more difficult for me to remember emotionally and, and in terms of my own re feelings as reader, what was, what did I feel the first time I read The Sun Also Rises? What, what did I feel the first time I read Absalom Absalom? What and in fact, uh, what did I feel the first time I, re I read To Kill a Mockingbird? Because for millions of people yet unborn, <laughs> it will be the first time. And our or Ma, I'll just speak for myself, my nitpicking and caviling and finding fault here and there and the other place with this, these little things, they're not, that, that doesn't matter much compared to the effect of that novel on a kid this minute who's 15 or 14 or whatever, who picks it up and reads it for the first time. Thank you. Well, that, that's, I think, a wonderful way to close our comments. So thank you all so much. So thank you all so much for taking part. It's been wonderful to have you. It's edu educational, entertaining, very happy. Um, thank you to our audience. 
can't do it without you. Uh, you're deeply appreciated. And of course, you're deeply appreciated for your contributions to the discussion. And of course, we do it for you. Uh, thank you so much for taking part in this. I will say again, if you have questions you want to ask, even if you didn't post them and they come up to you in your mind now, uh, send them to me, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L. -L. I'll pass them on to our panelists so they can have the option to respond to you. This will be available within 24 hours on YouTube. And we will be continuing our fine series of the great American literature. Um, I believe that our next one is going to be Matt My Antonia in maybe two weeks or so. If I'm wrong, somebody will shoot me for getting it wrong. But I believe we're on to Willa Cather and the Great Plains next. Um, you know, bring your parka for our next webinar. So um, thank you all so much. Been wonderful having you. Have a lovely afternoon. Alan, Chris, I hope I see Hi. you in the flesh before long. Thank you. Same down. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.